Welcome to Technology Host in New York. We had the honor to record Diego Salazar at Xcubicle, where he gave a talk about cryptocurrencies and privacy coins. Xcubicle is our favorite hangout when it comes to Monero meetups here in New York City. And Vic Sharma, the founder of the Cake Wallet, introduces Diego. He has a new version of the Cake Wallet online at the Apple Store, so please download the update. And without further ado, Diego Salazar. So Diego is a cypherpunk. Does everybody know what a cypherpunk is? Oh, I'll talk about that. He's yeah. an advocate of uh, privacy. <coughs> yeah, I don't say. Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're raising your hand. Oh, so I was okay. asking. Okay. And uh, he's been with, working on the Monero project for uh, close to two years. He designed and maintains the website, getmonero.org. He is um, continuously involved in educating the public uh, about Monero and also just blockchain in general. So, with that said, I'd like to uh, speak. Thanks, Marco. Right, so Vic introduced my name. My name is Diego Salazar. Uh, most people on the Reddit know me as Rarar, R E H R A R. There are three, H, uh, three R's and there is an H in there. Um, you don't really need to know any of that, it doesn't really matter. So, I wanted to title this presentation a Monero Spiel. But uh, my wife did, thought the presentation was better, so she went ahead and put that. And she makes all my stuff because um, I own a design firm, and we do websites. And I love open source projects, so as much as I can, I try to find open source projects in need because all, most of them have awful websites because there's a lot of tech people and no designers there. And so I try to do what I can to make a difference in the open source community in that way. Uh, I actually found Monero because when I first started my firm, I was like, okay, uh, where's a niche? Because it's a very competitive space. I got to find my niche. I'm like, oh, open source projects have like awful everything, and cryptocurrencies have like awful everything. And a year prior to that, I had looked at Bitcoin and found one cryptocurrency with an awful, awful website. I couldn't remember the name. So I was clicking through them, I'm like, this is it, and it was Monero. <laughs> so I went to the community, I'm like, hey, I can make you guys a new website. I'm trying to build my services here. And they're like, okay, yeah, but we do things a little differently here. And I start reading, I'm like, oh my gosh, this stuff can change the world. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get involved in this. You know, I came in to sell something, but I came out with a brand new perspective. And that's the perspective that I wanna give you guys today. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, in the cryptocurrency space, very, very, very few people know what they're talking about. I'm just gonna very bluntly say it right now, okay? Very few people know what they're talking about. What is blockchain? What does it really do? What goals was it trying to solve? What are the, what are the drawbacks? Nobody knows this stuff. All they know is put everything on the blockchain. And you know, in some ways I appreciate that because I expect most of these projects will end in catastrophic failure, but at least now we will know, we can analyze those things. Why did it end in failure? What went wrong? And usually the answer is gonna be because not everything needs to be decentralized and trustless, but um, we can kind of see which industries it works. And there may be some industries that we just never expect and it completely goes boom. Innovation happens after thousands and thousands of failures. So in some ways I appreciate those things happening, but I mean, there's a reason they probably don't get venture capital other than ICOs. So actually like 80% of my talk is not going to be about Monero, but it's going to be laying the foundations of blockchain in general for everybody to learn and understand. And after that, Monero really does become self-evident as one of the very few projects that has a real use case for blockchain. So that last 20%, I'm gonna kind of poke in on Bitcoin and Monero and see uh, why, why Monero is one of the projects that I really do invest into. So let's go ahead and get in on this. I've got, some of this stuff. So blockchain technology really depends on three crucial pillars that all work together. We like to think that blockchain is just technology, but it's not. It mixes in a whole bunch of different stuff. There is the technology there. But just stop it. No, stop. No, it's okay. Shh. Oh no, it's dead. Okay. Well, Pat, Pat, save me. In the meantime, you guys can hear my like stand-up comedy routine or something. No, but uh, there are three crucial pillars to this, and we, we can keep moving in without, you guys saw the pillars, right? You got the visual. So there is the technology there, for sure, but there is also the, <laughs> there is uh, the economics portion, and there is kind of an ethos portion. There is, there is a cypherpunk ethos portion that goes around that, and we're going to look at each of those three pillars in turn, and we're going to kind of really briefly touch on each of them, what they contribute to blockchain and why it matters. Um, because if we don't lay those foundations, then none of the things really make sense as we move forward. We might say, well, why did Bitcoin make those decisions? Or, or who made these decisions and why? And if we don't have these foundations, we can't really say why. So we're going to go ahead and keep moving forward at some point. If I can see what my next slide is going to be, that'd be fantastic. Um, it's okay, guys. It's okay. 
This is open source. This type of stuff happens all the time. <laughs> he says it's okay. I believe him. I believe in Pat. <laughs> Hashtag I believe in Pat. There we go. Okay, there you See? Go. There you go. See? My faith is not unfounded. The ethos. Okay, so we're actually going to talk about the ethos first. What's my next slide? Okay. We're going to talk about the ethos first. Why was this made? Why was Bitcoin made? Does anybody have an idea? Why was Bitcoin made? I don't know. Okay. What happened in 2008? What happened in 2008? Oh, pretty much it was a crash. Yeah, okay. Based on what happened in 2008, no one can say we need to establish a new that pretty much will have no turbine. You know, uh, no That's a trust for me. Yes. So they go, 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 they For the camera, for everybody who didn't hear, um, basically I'm going to summarize this. Bitcoin is really, at its core, an ideology. It's not a technology. It uses technology to fulfill an ideology. Okay, and th this is one of the this is one of the core basic things. Because Bitcoin was started with that, because blockchain was made around this ideology, if you try to apply blockchain to a whole bunch of different spheres where this ideology doesn't exist, it might not be the right tool for the job. Just like you don't use a wrench to hammer in a nail. You can, it'll it will probably go in after some time but it's not gonna be as good as if you used a hammer. You can use blockchain for a lot of things that, that didn't really move revolve around this ideology, but it's probably not going to be the right tool for the job. And we're, when we talk about the technology, we're gonna kind of poke into why. So um, as Vic said, I am a cypherpunk, in which there is a PH right there, going with the spelling. Some people say cypherpunks, and those also exist, but it's a slightly different thing. The basic idea behind a cypherpunk is that we want to use cryptography and mathematics to replace human trust. Because we know that humans are fallible. We know that humans can become corrupt, even if they start out good. We know that if, even if somebody is worthy of a good amount of power, and um, yeah, uh, uh, if, even if a person is worthy of power, they, they will die, and the person that succeeds them may not be worthy of that same power, but it's harder to kind of take that away. So we realize that humans are fallible in this way, and we say, okay, what if we can remove the human attack vector? And we're gonna start, when we talk about the technology, we're gonna go a little bit further into that, but what if we remove the human attack vector, minimize the surface of human corruption, and replace it with math and cryptography? So the idea is that during the crash, so like the crash and the bank bailouts and all this kind of stuff happened here in America, right? When we, talk, when we start talking about the economics, you know, actually, let's go ahead and talk about that, and I'll, and I'll uh, come back, cycle back into the ethos. Um, yeah, we'll get to this. I, I'm, I'm switching up my thingy a little bit here, uh, because I think this is important. So let's talk about the economics. What gives something value? It, I, I've given this spiel 50,000 times, and each time I give it a little bit differently, just because I try to read the person I'm talking to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to read the crowd a little bit. Yes, yes. And you have a couple questions? Yes, one, two. Oh, oh no, no, you had like, I thought it was a question. I answered that question. Oh. <laughs> that was an accident. Well, okay, sure. Look at something value. Scarcity. Yes, so there's two primary things, and scarcity, scarcity kind of feeds into one of them. Um, what gives something value? Two things in particular. Do I have a slide for this? I don't remember. Yes, I do. Agreement. When people agree something has value, it will have value. So the example that I like to give, if this doesn't make sense, the example that I like to give, I never played those, those games, those Neopets games, was that, that was a thing. And the, the club penguins. I don't, I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about. Those were kind of two online games, right? And then they had their different points and currencies and stuff. So like, let's say you have, you have a dozen eggs, and I want eggs. And I play this game. I'm like, okay, I will give you some of my Neopets dollars, points, whatever it is, um, in exchange for your eggs. But you don't play that game. So you're going to say, you know, this, is, this isn't really of any value to me, so I'm not going to trade my eggs for these things. But let's say you're an avid player of this game. Like, this game is your life. If, if somebody were to describe you, they would say the Neopets game, right? So you're like, oh shoot, that's a lot of points. You know, this, this is worth, I don't know if they're transferable, let's pretend they are. That's a lot of points. This is worth a lot to me. I really like this. So at that point, there is an agreement of value as to these points, even though basically they're basically worthless, right? But to you, they have value. And so I'm trading these to you for the eggs because I want the eggs. I want to make a cake so I can bring it to this Monero meetup. Nobody brought a cake and I'm very disappointed. But that's okay. So there's agreement between all these parties that something has value. If we extrapolate that and make that onto the, um, onto the country level, where now we have dollars, dollar bills, right? 
And we all agree that a dollar has value. Because if you take a dollar bill out of your pocket, it is literally just a piece of cotton and linen and some other stuff kind of mixed in there and ink. At face value, it is worthless. You can't do anything with it. You can burn it, and it's not gonna last you long. It's not gonna give a lot of light or a lot of heat. And if you think about it, a $100 bill and a $1 bill, aside from the ink, are more or less kind of made on the same stuff. So they're basically, at face value, equivalent in value. These things are basically worthless, but we agree that they have value. We agree that because there is a 100 printed on this and it came from the US government mint, that this is worth $100 worth of stuff. Value, I mean, agreement is the primary thing that drives value. There is also scarcity, but scarcity feeds into this agreement of value. Because if something is scarce and everybody knows that it's scarce, then everybody knows that only a few people can have it. So we all agree that, that that thing has more value. And we can make artificial scarcity. So like, let's say Fender makes only 15 of a certain type of guitar. You know what? Odds are there are other guitars in the world that will play just as well. And they could print more of these guitars if they wanted to. But they make an artificially scarce amount so they can excel it for very high prices. And just in the same way that if I take up a scoop of sand and say, hey, uh, I'll trade this for you uh, for something. You, you reach down and get your own scoop of sand, and you say, yeah, well, I'm just as rich as you are in sand. I don't need your sand. Sand is plentiful. There's so much sand. Nobody wants sand. But there's only 15 of these guitars. So the agreement that something has value, we just talked about scarcity. Um, so this leads kind of to inflation, which and we're going to pull that back into the ethos. Many people don't actually know what inflation is. They know that it means that their thing is worth less. They don't know why their thing is worth less. And the basic idea is that if the government or whoever, that's where basically the government has a monopoly on printing money, but not anymore with cryptocurrencies, but let's pretend that they do. Um, when the government decides to print another billion dollars, another two billion dollars, that means that there is more dollars in existence, more dollars to go around to all the different people. And because there are more in existence, it is less scarce. And so with that in mind, everyone's individual dollars becomes worth less. Does that make sense? Kind of, so that, that's, that's really what inflation is at its core. The more times the government prints money, the less everybody else's is worth. So you can imagine that you know, on, a, on a yearly basis, it's not gonna have a, a huge effect, but over 40, 50, 60, 70 years, you hear about people purchasing hamburgers for 25 cents or you know, a, a, a book for, for a couple of quarters. And that's not the case today. It's like, well, why is this the way that it is? Well, the reason is because inflation is happening <clears throat> and more and more dollars are coming into existence. At one point, we were on something called the gold standard where the government had a certain amount of gold in their reserves and they could not print more dollars than they had in those reserves. So if they wanted to print more dollars, they would have to get more gold and put it in there. At one point, the government decided, you know what, and there's, there's a huge amount of variables that went into this after World War II, blah, 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 blah. The government decided, we're, we're coming off of the gold standard. Your dollars are no longer exchangeable for gold. And this meant that they could print however many dollars they wanted. There was kind of a hard cap limit because you have to put a certain amount of time, energy, and resources into excavating gold. And this is one of the reasons gold has value, because gold is scarce, but it has a connection to entropy. It has a connection to human effort that sets a baseline dollar value for gold. Because if gold was worth less than the amount it takes for me to excavate it, then I wouldn't excavate it. And we're going to really briefly touch on why proof of work does something similar and stuff like that. So, hard currency. This is something many people don't really understand. And we're all, we're going to, we haven't touched on blockchain yet. We're going to tie this all in, but I'm trying to get a couple of uh, concepts down because when we do talk about blockchain, it's like, ah, okay, that's why we're talking about these things. Hard currency is defined as a currency that is very stable in value over long periods of time. And economists have kind of changed the definition to even if it changes in value, it is measured and we know how much it's gonna change in value. We can project how much it's gonna change in value over the next 100 years, over the next decade, stuff like that. Um, and I, I'm, you know, some economists agree with that definition, that redefinition, others don't. This is important because we hear a lot about, well, Bitcoin is a hard currency because there's only a certain amount of it that will ever exist at once. And after the last Bitcoin is mined, we're not gonna have any more Bitcoins. 
So that's going to mean that Bitcoin itself is going to be stable forever. And it's not quite true. They haven't really thought this through because even though the amount of Bitcoin stays the same, the amount of humans does not stay the same. We are increasing, which means that per human, there is less Bitcoin, which means the price of Bitcoin is actually going to trend upwards as time goes on. And, you know, so um, I'm not going to talk too much about hard currency. I don't want to talk too much about all these uh, definitions and stuff. We talked about the gold standard. Uh, so we're going to jump back now. You guys like my little pictures? We're going to jump back now to cypherpunks, what we're all about. So Satoshi, probably even has Satoshi, Satoshi, and some people say Satoshi. He looked at kind of the government bailout, where basically the banks started to go under because of their own bad decisions, because of their fractional reserve banking, all these different things they do to make more money that are actually very risky, and they paid for it in the long run. They, they're like, okay, we're all gonna go bankrupt. And the government says, okay, if they go bankrupt, so many people lose all of their money, the economy's gonna crash, everything's gonna go wrong. We have no choice but to print billions of dollars to give to these banks. And the, you know, they say we loaned it to them with interest. They, they, they justify it in whatever way. So that way they don't go under. And what most people don't realize is that this is actually a tax on society that you never agreed to. Because when they do print billions more dollars to compensate these businesses that take very risky decisions, they were basically playing with our money. And they, they, they were gambling it all away and they lost. And the government says, okay, we're gonna print billions of more dollars which devalues all of our dollars to bail them out. This is when Satoshi said, this is not gonna, we, we can't live like this anymore. Because there is a huge, huge, huge human attack vector, the attack vector of trust. We have no direct control over how many dollars will ever come into existence, how many are printed in one year. The only control we have is to elect people who will hopefully appoint qualified, competent people. It's very indirect, it's very messy, it gets really weird, some of it's privately controlled, some of it's not, depends on if you're conspiracy theorist or not, or whatever, I don't care. The core is we are trusting people, and this trust can be abused. And cypherpunks are all about removing this element of trust that is so dangerous and replacing it with provable math and cryptography. And we see that in Bitcoin, something I've already mentioned. We know how many Bitcoin will ever exist. We can very closely estimate how many Bitcoin will exist tomorrow, depending on block times and how quickly the miners find stuff. But we know how many Bitcoin exists right now. We know how many Bitcoin will ever exist when the last Bitcoin is mined. This is enforced through cryptography. And unless we change that code, and there's a new social covenant, and everybody starts running the new code, it will always be that way. So in this way, there is surety. And this plays into the economics of hard currency because if people agree that, remember agreement is where value comes from, if people agree that, you know what, we can be sure of Bitcoin because we know where Bitcoin is going in terms of how much, we don't, may not know where it's coming in terms of price, but we know how many will exist, we know how many people exist, so we can kind of estimate over the next 10 years, over the next 15 years, much better than, well, let's try to make some estimations about the dollars without knowing what the government's gonna do, or sometimes they don't tell people what they're gonna do, and you can look all over the world for some governments that have made some very controversial decisions about how they're gonna handle their cash. So that's the human, um, oh, we're gonna talk about floss. I like floss, so do you, who flosses? This, this is not what the floss means. Um, just just as an exa another example of cypherpunk that doesn't have to do with cryptocurrencies, just because I'm a cypherpunk and I wanna kind of spread my stupid religion, um, <clears throat> is free, libre, open source software, which cryptocurrencies are usually open source software, but just this idea that when you download something and it's proprietary software, the, 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 the source code is closed, and you're running it on your computer, you are trusting the vendor, the person who made it, that they're not doing anything more than they say they are doing on your computer. You can't check up on them because you can't read the code, so you can't see what's actually going on behind the scenes. To me, it's like if you invite a plumber into your house to do some plumbing that you've got him to do, and he's like, so I, I want to work here, but can I ask you to please leave your house while I work? And you're like, why? Just do the job that I told you to do, doesn't matter where I am in my house, and leave. He's like, yeah, but I'll, I'll just feel more comfortable if you leave your house. You know, I, I'm probably going to find a different plumber, but that's really what 
closed source software is doing. It's saying, okay, we, we, you're trusting us to just be a word processor. You're trusting us to just be a browser, to just, and not to record what you're doing, not to record your keystrokes, all this different type of stuff. And you have to trust them. Of course, if they do certain stuff, it's illegal. Some stuff is in gray areas, but you're still trusting that they won't. And many people have got caught doing things that they shouldn't. And we don't like that trust thing. So we're going to always come back to that. And especially we're going to come back to that as we go to blah, 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 the technology. Now we're going to talk about Bitcoin. We have to keep in mind, reduce trust, eliminate trust. Reduce trust, eliminate trust. I'm going to be talking about that this whole time. The central theme, if you get nothing else out of this talk, all blockchains do, their big claim to fame is one thing, trustlessness. Remove Trust. Blockchains. Databases. Okay, let's start with databases. Who knows what a database is? Some people, who doesn't know what a database is? You kind of heard that name before, but you don't really know quite what it is. Basically, what a database is, is just a table of information. Diego, hair color, brown. Eye color, brown. Height, whatever, right? And we've got everybody here with their hair color and their eye color. And so at any point in time, anybody can look at that table that we've made and say, okay, just return all the results of brown-haired people to me and I'll get a list. Or return all the results of blue-eyed people to me and I'll, or I'll get a, and I'll get a list. Everything is based off of databases. Amazon has a gigantic database with, and each product is in it, and each unique product has how many are in stock and um, what, what colors do we have. And so when you do a search on Amazon, um, show me TVs. It gets all the TVs that it has on, it searches through the database, it gets all the TVs and gives them to you, it shows it to you on a thing. The, the problem with databases is trust. There are two primary things that we are trusting in all databases. First, every database has an administrator, a system maintainer, somebody who can, without consequence or without, and I mean, they need credentials to be that maintainer, they can go in and change any field at any time. So in our hypothetical database, they can go to the Diego field and change eye color to green. My eye color isn't green, so he's lying. And this is a stupid database anyway, anyway, nobody cares. The other thing that we are trusting is let's say they're honest, let's say they're not malicious. Many, many, times, many times they're not malicious, they're just incompetent, right? So they set up bad um, firewalls and bad protection around their database. We're also trusting in the protection they have put around the database because even if they are not malicious, there are malicious third parties out there somewhere, scary people, that want to come change our database. They want to hack into the Amazon database so they can reduce the price of the TV from $1,000 to $10, purchase it, and then put it back. Right? I'm just giving stupid examples, but basically this is, this, is the, this is where the trust comes in in a database. We're trusting the system maintainers and we are trusting in their defense systems that they have put up against third parties. Now, against stupid databases like the ones we made up with or Amazon, which only really affects them, the fact of the matter is that databases are now running our banking systems as well. When I go to a bank and give them $5, they don't take out the Diego box, put the $5 in the Diego box and put it back. And when I return for that $5, take out that same Diego box and give me the same $5, right? That doesn't happen. They take my $5, put it in this general pool of money, and keep track of who has how much via a database. So when it comes to people's money, it's a little more important that things are more secure, that the defense systems are higher, that we hire the most trusted people instead of just random people to maintain these databases and update these databases. But we, the thing I keep saying is that word trust, trust, trust. And you know, in some cases, it works. What, what is our solution as humans? We make it so that way if you do something bad with that trust, it's illegal and you go to jail. So we try to solve this through human means, which can also be corrupt, inefficient, or malicious. Because we do have trusted people in our banks that were doing these things, and what happened? The bailout of 2008, which we were just talking about. And so even though there was probably a lot of stupid stuff, risky stuff, maybe even illegal stuff that were going on along there, a lot of people did not get punished that maybe should have. So these human means can fail on several different infrastructure levels. On the level of the banking systems, on the level of the regulations that are made, on the level of the enforcement of the regulations that are made. And some people got sick of this. And they said, we want to eliminate this trust. But how do we eliminate the trust of databases. Databases run the world. 
That's where we started. That's where Satoshi started. He said, we have to first eliminate trust from the database. And if we do that, much of the problem is solved already. We still have other problems. If you look through any Bitcoin forum or anything, you'll see, you know, oh, how do we do this or how do we do this? And there's still problems to solve. But one of the biggest problems is trust in the database. So we're going to get there. We're going to talk about what happened. Uh, no, we're not talking about privacy. Let me stick here. Um, how do we solve that problem? We solved that problem. He solved that problem. And keep in mind, what I'm about to tell you is a very, very, very gross oversimplification of how blockchains work. But even just understanding these analogies and the concepts that I'm about to tell you, you're going to understand how blockchains work better than 80% of the people in this space. Really, the, 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 the level of knowledge in this space is, is quite low. <laughs> the bar is, is quite small. Um, so, the idea is that instead of one person or a small group of people maintaining this database and having the rights to kind of update it, we are going to give this database to anybody who wants it. You want it, you can have it. You want it, you can have it. You can have a copy. You can have a copy. Everybody can have a copy. And at that point, if I want to, we're just going to talk about Bitcoin. If I want to give myself an extra 15 Bitcoins, I can go into my database and update my balance to 50 more Bitcoins. But now all of a sudden, I am out of sync with everybody else's database. So if I try to spend those Bitcoins, you're like, uh, yeah, but see, I don't have you as having those 50 Bitcoins in my version of the database. And I talked with this guy and he doesn't have you. He doesn't have, you don't have those according to him either. So I contacted 50 other people and none of us think that you have these 50 Bitcoins. So we're not going to allow this on, on our, uh, we're not going to update our databases. Thank you. Thanks for trying. So at that point, I can delete my version of the database and re-download a correct version from somebody else. This also makes it unhackable from third parties in traditional ways. Because let's say somebody doesn't like me, has a grudge against me, he hacks into my database and I have 100 bitcoins, but now he says I have zero bitcoins. And I go onto my wallet and I'm panicking, what happened to my bitcoins? What happened to these? And I start asking some of my peers, hey, uh, so what, what happened to my Bitcoin? Were they spent? No, I, I think that you still have them. I, you, I, think you still, I think you still have them. Okay, you know what? I just delete my version of the database and re-download from my friends. And the cool thing is I don't even have to trust the person that I'm downloading from. I can download from you and you and you and you and you and you and compare those downloads together and see, okay, uh, these are all in agreement so I can be very sure reasonably sure that this is the correct version of the database. If I wanted to reduce the trust to zero, I can re-download from everybody in the world, compare them against each other, and then at that point be 100% sure of the accurate version of the database. The trust is at this point in our hands. Who do we want to trust and how much do we want to trust them? If I want to trust zero people, then I can re-download from everybody. So, but that's not really practical all the time. So sometimes I'm gonna say, you know what, I'll do re-download from 10. Some people are willing to say, I'm willing to download from one. And in some cases, I may have one version of the database and I'm migrating to another and I may just download from myself because I trust myself, right? So at this point, the trust is in our hands. The protocol itself supports zero trust. And this is extremely important. If zero trust is not an option, it is not cypherpunk. Zero trust must be an option for something to be cypherpunk. And at that point, we can choose. I'm okay with 2% trust, 50% trust, 100% trust, it doesn't matter. But it must at least be an option for us. So in this way, we are removing the human attack vector of trust from our financial institutions and the way that they want to go. And you know what? Bitcoin may not be the way to go. Bitcoin says we are going to have this many Bitcoins that will ever be in existence. Maybe that is too small. Maybe it's too much. We don't know. This whole thing is an experiment because this has not been done before. So to anyone who says, I can guarantee you that this will do this and this will make money and this, there are no guarantees. There are no guarantees. And anybody who tells you otherwise is an idiot. But this, uh, this really cool way of kind of decentralizing trust, so that way we can get rid of it, it has a trade-off. And that trade-off is the privacy trade-off. And this is kind of where we're going to get really, we're going to kind of get to in there. If everybody has the database, 
then that means that anybody can look at the database. They can't change it, but they can look at it. So if I send 50 Bitcoins to this guy, if you guys have never seen a Bitcoin address, then, I mean, it's not like it says Diego is sending, it says a long alphanumeric string sending to another long alphanumeric string, but you can see that that trans transaction has taken place between these two wallets. And if at any point you can identify who one or both of those alphanumeric strings are, then you can know who now has these Bitcoins, where did they come from? This is the privacy trade-off. Everybody has access to this database. And it's the equivalent of you posting your PayPal or bank statements online every month as soon as you get them for everyone to see. And whenever people tell me, well, you know, nobody needs this level of privacy that Monero offers. Nobody needs this from Monero. I say, okay, I would like your bank statements, please. Here's my email. Send them to me. I will post them publicly on several forums. Nobody takes me up on it. If you want to be the first because you want to prove a point, please do. I will expect them for the rest of your life. This is what Bitcoin is. Because this database is not changeable, and because it is immutable and it's, it's there forever for everyone to download whenever they want, your transactions are there. And this has more than just kind of privacy, I'd rather not people know what I purchased. This has implications where people can die. If you are living in a country with an oppressive government and they can identify what you are doing, and it doesn't have to be something malicious. Maybe you're purchasing Bibles in a country where this is illegal. Maybe you're a gay person and you're trying to transact in some way and they can identify you as that way in a country that is really against and harsh towards these people. This can have real, real consequences on human lives. This, when people say, I, I don't need privacy, well, my, good for you. But not everyone is in your shoes. This can be, oh, man, you, hear, you hear about what happens when somebody gets tortured for their private keys. This has happened in the past. Where you can identify how much somebody has, and you can go after that person. Let's say I'm traveling in South America. I go to a little taco stand there, right? They, we accept Bitcoin, great, I pay in Bitcoin. And on the blockchain, they see it came from this wallet. Okay, I'm gonna click on that wallet in the block explorer. Shoot, this guy's got 100,000 Bitcoins. Me and my cousins, we're gonna go pay this guy a visit, find out where he is, make him give us our private keys. This is a big deal. Privacy is a big deal. And it's something that we just really just give away. But we're going to talk about, eh, what's the next one? Yeah, we're going to talk about Monero. I'm going to stick on this slide because I like the binoculars a little bit more. Uh, I like Monero a little bit more. The other thing that this, this has to do with is something called fungibility. Who's heard, that, who's heard that word, fungible? Most people don't know what it means because it's something we don't learn. We take it for granted. Fungibility is the idea that one of something is equal to another of the same unit of that something. And that kind of, kind, of, kind of sounds confusing, but so I'm gonna give an example. If you have a dollar, and I have a dollar, and we exchange dollars, we now have different dollars, but there has not been a transaction of value, correct? Because we both have one dollar's worth of dollars. But if you have a Bitcoin, and I have a Bitcoin, and we exchange Bitcoins, there may have been an exchange of value because Bitcoin is not fungible. Let's talk about why. That's a big statement to make. That's a big accusation that I just made. Bitcoin is not fungible. If anything has a traceable, let's get back on track. You can update Windows because your device wasn't free at the scheduled time. <laughs> if something has a traceable history, it is not fungible. It cannot be exchanged one for one. Let's say I have two little trinkets that are exactly the same, made in the same place at the same time by the same company, but I can prove that one of them belonged to Justin Bieber, to Madonna, to whoever, famous person, right? Now, even though they are the exact same thing, one of them is gonna sell for a lot more. More value is attributed <coughs> to one of these trinkets. And it all has to do with the traceable past, knowing where it came from. And in the same way, if I have 
two identical dollars. But I can prove that very recently this dollar has been through a drug transaction. Well, at that point, the government comes and knocks on your door and says, hey, this is evidence um, that we're going to take this via civil forfeiture. You're also, now, by the way, you should watch your back, you're also a suspect in this case. We'll be talking to you later. Stay in town. So at that point, if I know that something has gone through an illicit transaction, I might be willing to get rid of this thing at a discount because I don't want it to be taken from me and then I lose everything. I'd rather have 80 cents that I can know for sure I can keep rather than a dollar that can be taken from me at any time. And many people have had their exchange accounts shut down, their Coinbase accounts shut down because in the last 10 transactions, in the last five transactions, this Bitcoin, the, the great big is raising his hand, this Bitcoin has gone through something illicit. And you may have had nothing to do with it. Maybe these two people transacted and they did an illicit transaction and I run a t-shirt shop and he sends the Bitcoin to me and I send him t-shirts. But now that Bitcoin is in my possession. So I'm the one that they're saying, hey, where, where, where'd you get this? Oh shoot, man, I don't want this thing, let me get rid of it. So some people are willing to purchase new Bitcoins, brand new minted off the blockchain at a premium, a little bit more than they're worth because they're clean. And they're willing to get rid of dirty Bitcoins at a discount. One Bitcoin is not one Bitcoin. If we exchange Bitcoins, I give you a dirty one, you give me a clean one. There's a difference of value now. Bitcoin is not fungible. And it will never be unless things are hidden by default, mandatory. This is Monero. This is Monero's claim to fame. Monero said, we like Bitcoin. We love everything that it does in terms of removing trust. But it has this one critical flaw. It is not fungible. And as a merchant, it is just impossible to do business with a currency that is not fungible. Because if I am a Bitcoin-only business, I have to check every Bitcoin that comes through my doors. Is this bad? How, when, when was the last time it went through a bad transaction? Five transactions ago, 10 transactions ago? How can I tell the government I had nothing to do with this? You know, I'd rather not deal with that headache. You look at cash, $5. I don't know where it's been. I don't care where it's been. All I know is I can spend it on $5 worth of stuff. This is Monero. It hides the sender, it hides the receiver, and it hides the amount. And you'd be shocked, you'd be shocked how much, like if it just, if it doesn't hide the amount, you'd be shocked how much, that, that's metadata, how much someone can glean just from that, linking transactions, saying you bought this here. Privacy is really, really tough. And all of these private, privacy cryptocurrencies, the issue is that blockchain as a technology on the, that depends on these three pillars of ethos, technology, and economics that we talked about is a very separate discipline from privacy technologies. And just because you're an expert in blockchain, most people think that they can just kind of bolt on privacy and it's gonna work. And it's not gonna work. Anyone who knows anything about privacy knows that privacy is really, really, really hard. It's extremely hard to get right. You can't just go on tour and you're good. No, you have to change the way that you browse. Because if you're like a guy that really likes cricket bars, bars made out of cricket flour, if you're a guy that really likes cricket bars and you're always going on cricket, bar.com and then I log on to tour because I want to do something weird or I want to I want to go on some forum or whatever but before I do I, I just really quickly I'm going to check cricketbar.com they don't know that I made that request all my internet service provider knows is that I'm on tour at that time but oh looky here this guy who was on this tour circuit goes to cricketbar.com and because, I, because they know that that's the place that I go and they know that I happen to be online tour at the same time, that's a correlation attack, that's a timing attack, and from there, that circuit is compromised. If you log on to your Facebook, if you log on to your personal site, your circuit is compromised. Privacy is super hard. It's super hard to get right. And most people approach privacy coins like, okay, we'll just take this blockchain technology that we know nothing about and take these privacy technologies that we know nothing about and kind of throw them in a bowl and mix them together and think it's a cake. And that's not how this works. And there's real consequences, as we discussed. There's very real consequences to getting this wrong. There's nothing wrong with cake. Right? <laughs> People's money is at stake. 
people's freedom is at stake, people's lives are at stake. This is not something we just kind of, let's just throw this in there and see what happens. The other way that some people think about it is, well, we don't want to kind of be like super privacy because then the government's not going to like us and stuff. So we have optional privacy. Optional privacy is also not fungible, guys. Sorry to break it to you because now all of a sudden in my wallet, I do a, a public transaction, public transaction, public transaction, private transaction. Okay, what, what were you doing there that needed to be private that the other ones didn't need to be private? The private ones stick out from the public ones. Meaning, okay, we're not going to accept any coin that has in the past five to ten transactions been through any sort of private transaction. Not fungible. Doesn't work that way. The only way is if all of the information is private, mandatory, and by default. Everybody has to do it. Hide in the crowd. If it's not that way, it's not fungible. And this is just a technical requirement of fungibility. It is a technical requirement of being a currency. People get really like super weirded out, like, oh, I don't need this level of privacy. At some point, man, it's not even about the privacy anymore. It's about the fungibility. It's about using this thing as a real currency, like we're supposed to. Because like I said, merchants and users and everybody, they, they just don't want to have to check whether something is gone through a bad transaction or not. And some Bitcoin people will tell you, the maximalists, the people that are not always right in the head, I love you to death, but they're, you know, they're nuts, what do you do? Uh, at some point, the, the Bitcoin people are going to tell you, well, it's, it's fine, you just use a different address. You never reuse the same address. You just use a different address each time, and they can never link it to you. What a, what a user experience nightmare. We're talking about mass adoption here, and we're expecting people to use new addresses every time, write down every single one of those private keys and never lose them. You know, or you can just use Monero. You write down one private key, and you're not going to have to work. I'm not going to make any claims that Monero is perfect. There are ways, like if you look at MoneroLink.com, which is no longer applicable, but you know, at one point it was, there are ways to kind of try to get metadata from, for example, if I only ever sync my node and use my wallet when I make a transaction and then I turn it off, then they don't see the transaction, but they see my internet service provider sees Diego's using Monero. No, he's not using Monero. You know, we can be reasonably sure that they will probably send a transaction in that time. So we'll go to the blockchain and, oh shoot, we can't see receivers or who he sent anything to or what the amount was. Okay, that's really tough. We know that he's probably one of these transactions because it was in that time, but we don't know anything about that transaction. But see, Monero is so committed to privacy that even that scares us. We're like, oh shoot, we don't want them to be able to even be able to see that. We don't want you don't want them to even that little bit of information we don't want. Because little bits of information are the things that kill you. In court, wherever. So that's been narrow. Is that my last slide? That is my last slide. Okay. So the last thing I guess I'm gonna talk about then in terms of Monero. And then it's kind of a little bit broad. Is privacy in general. Privacy is Monero. Monero and privacy are both tools. They're tools that people are, are scared of because government regulation, because you know the feds aren't going to like this and this type of stuff. The more powerful the tool, the more you can do with it, the more you can help people with it, but the more damage it can do. This is true. This is this has always been true. A regular saw, I can cut a tree down, I can chop, I can cut wood, I can do whatever. Right, it's going to take a long time, but I can do it. A chainsaw, I can do these things a lot faster, but it can also be used to kill people a lot faster. At some point, every tool is going to have human consequences, things that can be used for bad. But all of these tools unlock amazing opportunities that we do not have access to right now. Opportunities like people getting their freedom, people being able to transact with people in other countries without having to go through the garbage current system of Oh man, I've got family in Russia, I've got family in Mexico, and uh, this is one of the biggest reasons why I'm here. I do have family in Russia, and Russia is getting worse by the day. I'm not trying to get into politics or anything, but people suffer, and my family suffers there, my wife's family. And I want an ability to get money to them, from them, at any reason, for any time, without anyone's permission. This is the matter. And I don't want to have to, like, the government's like, oh, okay, well, we see this came, so we're just going to go ahead and take these Bitcoins. At any point, they can come in on trumped-up charges and just take 
people stuff. And there needs to be a healthy tension, as a cypherpunk, I believe there needs to be a healthy tension between citizens and their governments. And too often we just rely on the internal checks and balances. Well, Congress and the president and the judicial system keep themselves in check. No, not always do they do that. Many times they don't. Things like encryption, open source software, privacy enhancing software like Monero, they allow this tension where we don't just give everything away so freely which enables a passive surveillance state, which is literally no different than the Gestapo. The Gestapo were the judge, the jury, and the executioner. We have something called due process for a reason, where if I suspect you of something, I can go get a warrant, and then I can see what you're doing, instead of just allowing everyone to see what I'm doing by, by default. This is not the way democracy works. This is not the way freedom works. This is what cypherpunks believe. This is what we fight for. And so for me, I'm largely into Monero, not because of the cryptocurrency reasons and the crypto blockchain and all that different type of stuff. I'm in here because I want to see free people. I want to see people that do not have to work, like the Venezuelan people have to work, about what the government people are doing with their money, how they're handling money, responsibly or not. I want to see people live good lives. Not everyone is coming at this from the same, I'm not trying to guilt trip everyone, if you're in here for the money, you know, there, but there is a bigger reason for this stuff, an exciting reason for this stuff, something to really get behind, more than just making the money. Money's nice, everybody likes money, that's fine. Some people like to see the price go up, and nobody likes to see the price go down. I've got Monero, I check the price every once in a while, and it goes down, I'm like, ah. It's a fun game, it's pretty funny. I, really, I basically own nothing but Monero, so if you're gonna add, like, literally I have like $17 worth of Bitcoin that I can't exchange for some reason. Um, I own basically nothing but, and that's not true, I own TerraCoin, because I made their websites, <laughs> and they paid me in TerraCoin. <laughs> I should have asked for Monero. I still have it. <laughs> so that's basically it, that's basically my presentation. That's kind of what Monero's all about. I didn't really delve into the privacy aspects, like how do we hide this, how do we hide that? That stuff is very available. I really think that these foundational stuff are so important, because it's not so available. All these foundational things, you're gonna to talk to different people, and you're gonna get bad, um, there are conflicting opinions and conflicting ideas. But really these foundations are what make Monero what it is. Because the community, by and large, is ideologically driven. This is what separates Monero from the rest of the crowd. Monero is pretty much what Bitcoin used to be like. A whole bunch of ide um, ideologically driven people coming together that have a passion for privacy. And we're trying to make this happen. Thank you very much. I'll take questions now if anybody has them.